so good to be back here with you. I appreciate Pastor Jacob filling in as I was out sick last Sunday. I've been I've missed two Sundays in 14 years of pastoring due to illness, and so uh, it was a pretty serious case of bronchitis. But I've overcome it. Praise the Lord. Take your Bible. Turn to Revelation two, if you have your Bible with you. Revelation two. Today we are continuing our message series. Uh, through the book of Revelation, and we looked at uh, the church in Ephesus, then we transitioned to the church in Smyrna, now we're looking at the church in Pergamum, Pergamum. Some of your Bibles might say Pergamos, but uh, it really doesn't matter, we're talking about the same place, Pergamum. We're going to look at verses 12 through 17 today. So let's look at what the Bible says. I teach out of the English Standard Version. Revelation 2, beginning in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught the Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone, that no one except the one who receives it. No one knows except the one who receives it. Uh, May God be glorified through the reading of his word. Uh, Pergamum was a city that was very distinctive. It was the capital city of the Roman Empire of Asia. And, or at least through the first century it was. And it was not a great commercial city. There were no vast trade routes. There were no huge harbors. It was not a city that was known for its commerce or its trade or anything like that. But it was a religious city. Pergamum was distinguished in that whatever weird idea was kind of floating around Asia at the time, religiously speaking, it would somehow end up in that place. Now, I'm not going to ask you to say them out loud, but have you, any of you heard some weird religious ideas? You know what I'm talking about? Just weird. And even claiming to be Christian ideas, but you can't find them in the Bible, and they're strange, and you just wonder, what is the deal with that? Well, Pergamum was filled with this kind of thought process. And Pergamum just seemed to have uh, a feeling of thriving on religious ideas. It had many religious institutions and organizations. And it was a, a community that was given over to wealth and to fashion. And it was a very high class place. The church that we see in Pergamum, it lived and served in the shadow of Satan's headquarters. And today's message is entitled, Pergamum, Where Satan Set Up His Headquarters. And I wonder where Satan's headquarters are located today. I really wonder that. Satan's always loved luxury and wealth and worldliness. I have an idea that his headquarters are probably set up somewhere in the Western world. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Satan's headquarters were set up right here in the United States, matter of fact. In that day, the Lord said that Satan set up his headquarters in Pergamum, according to Revelation 2. Now, because Pergamum was an imperial city, the center of emperor worship, it was a city that understood authority and the chain of command. And so Jesus introduced himself as the one, in verse 12, where it says, the words of him who has the sharp, two-edged sword. And in ancient times, the highest symbol of authority was the sword. 
The sword represented the greatest authority that people knew. And when one talked about the sword, one talked about absolute authority. The one who carried the sword, it was said in ancient times, had the right of life and of death. Jesus introduced himself to a city which was a political headquarters as the one with the sword. He's the one who's in charge. Jesus is the one with absolute authority. And so he was introducing himself to this church in this manner. Now, if you're taking notes this morning, we're going to start getting into the body of the message. All, all of what was said already is, is by way of introduction. The first point is this, dedication, dedication. You can see this in verse 13. In verse 13, it says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now notice the dedication of this church. Here was a church in the shadow of Satan's throne, right? And Jesus noted their dedication. He was grateful for their dedication. And he was uh, explaining to them his gratitude for their dedication. I want you to imagine the peril of being a member of a church that was so close to Satan's headquarters. The headquarters of Satan is a strategic place where he can best use his influence And that's always been in the greatest centers of worldliness and greatness. So Jesus told them that he realized they were located near Satan's throne. And I've just got to think that would be really difficult for a church to thrive when they're sitting in the shadow of Satan's headquarters. Now you think about the most ungodly cities in America today. You think about uh, Las Vegas. Think about New Orleans, places like this where it it is just downright, there are downright evil things that take place in some of these cities. And think about how difficult it is for churches to thrive in cities that have such great sin. Uh, I've got to think it must have been really difficult for the church at Pergamum to thrive. And so the Lord Jesus begins this letter by saying, hey, there's some dedication that I see here in verse 13. I'm, I'm grateful for that. See, the world is forever the enemy of God. And that which is material, that which is sensual, that which is built on lust is forever against the things of God. And here's a little statement that I think is important for us to note. You might want to write this down. Behind every appeal of mammon lurks Satan. Here's what I mean by that. In this circumstance of this church, Jesus said, I know your works, I know where you're located. And I know that you are located in the shadow of Satan's headquarters. And I see your dedication to me, and I'm I'm appreciative of that. In the middle of verse 13, it says, Yet you hold fast my name. You hold fast my name. To hold fast the name of Jesus means they were loyal to the person of Jesus Christ. The name is the symbol of the person. And always in the scripture, the name of God, of Christ, represents his character. So this church confirmed that Jesus Christ was Lord. And I want us to remember that. The church at Pergamum, for its, its warts, its faults, and we're going to get into those here in just a moment, they did indeed recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. That's something I want to remind you, Farmington First, that we remember that Jesus Christ is Lord. This church confirmed his honor. They confirmed Jesus' glorious nature, his holy character, his redeeming power. They held fast to the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. He is King. He is Lord. In the church at Pergamum, they held to that. More than that, it says, you did not deny my faith. You see that in verse 13? Jesus says, you did not deny my faith. Notice he says, my faith. Jesus is talking about his faith and not the faith of the people of the church at Pergamum. You did not deny my faith. I think that's kind of interesting. Who has better faith than Jesus? Nobody. 
and you didn't deny the faith of Christ. So there was some dedication there, and Jesus acknowledges that. And then secondly, we can get into some friction. Some friction. You can see this in verses 14 through 15 as we exposit this text together. Look at verse 14 and following. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to, be, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they may eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. But there was a problem in Pergamum here. It's a problem that exists today, possibly more strongly than ever in human history. See, the church was faithful, absolutely. It believed that Jesus Christ is God, he's king, he's Lord, even in the midst of the headquarters of Satan. But uh, they tolerated, this is the best way to word this, the church at Pergamum tolerated that, ought, that which ought to be expelled from the church. They had come to compromise error. And I think it's really important for us to remember we are not to allow doctrinal error to be within the confines of this congregation. Amen? The church did not hold false doctrine at, at, at Pergamum. They did not hold false doctrine. It was a proper Orthodox church. But it was a little too tight with people who did. It talks about the doctrine of Balaam. Now that lends the question, what was the doctrine of Balaam? Well, I'm so glad you asked. They allowed the doctrine of Balaam. Balaam, if you just cross-reference Revelation 2, 14 and 15 over to Numbers 22 and 23, you'll see what the doctrine of Balaam was all about. You see, the doctrine of Balaam is a situation where Balaam was called by a king to curse Israel in Numbers 22 and 23. And every time that Balaam opened his mouth to curse Israel, he wound up actually blessing Israel. <laughs> it became frustrating for Balaam. He was offered money to curse Israel, but he couldn't do it. He absolutely failed. And on his way home, he thought that he was really... Uh, just not able to do this. And so he thought, man, maybe I could make some money on the side if I prophesy like that. And he did not try to change their theology or to curse the nation. What Balaam did is he just encouraged them to compromise the purposes of God. He polluted the people both socially and spiritually. And the end result in verse 14 here in Revelation 2 is that a stumbling block was said to be put in place. A stumbling block right before the children of Israel. And it resulted in eating things that were sacrificed to idols and committing immoral acts. They taught that, that orthodoxy gives a license to sin. And I have a little bit of a concern that I see happening just culturally wide in evangelicalism where... It's good to have proper orthodoxy, to have good theology, but I, this is just my observation anecdotally speaking. Um, I do not see holiness to be as big of a deal in the evangelical world as it should be. Separation from the world. Watching stuff you shouldn't be watching. Using language you shouldn't be using. Where you can say, yes, I believe in all the proper 
uh, orthodox things, but from a, an orthopraxy standpoint, from living out your orthodoxy, it's not really jiving together. See, people were so conservative and so fundamental and so orthodox in their beliefs, yet they, they began to buy this philosophy characterized by the wisdom of the world. And this doctrine of Balaam, it was an attack on the standards of separation from the world that God expected Israel to maintain. And I just want to plead with you and encourage you to make sure that you take holiness very seriously. I spoke to our youth on a Wednesday night several months ago about this very topic when I was talking about the question that every teenager on earth and every single person asks this question of how far is too far to go with somebody who's not your spouse, but you're dating them. And I just say, that's, that's the wrong question to begin with. The question should be, how can this relationship most glorify God? Because when I stand on this ledge, it makes some of you nervous when you see my feet dangling over this. Why would I see how far I can stand over this ledge before falling off instead of saying, let's just not even come close to that and let's just see if we can glorify God from here. The doctrine of Balaam was a serious issue that was infiltrating the church at Pergamum where they were not really a holy people. And then there was the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. The church was faithful. It believed in Jesus Christ, but, uh, and they had, they had not denied their faith. They, they tolerated what ought to be expelled. They had come to compromise with error. So the church did not hold false doctrine. It was a proper Orthodox church, but it held fellowship with those who did. So we saw some friction with the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And um, it is possible for us under the guise of being broad-minded. And I want to be broad-minded. I want to have a big tent perspective of uh, being able to cooperate with people who have different views of tertiary theological issues. But when we say, I want to be broad-minded to the point where it's dangerous, that's where it concerns me as your pastor. And I'm seeing this especially with the woke stuff. And it just, I could just feel the tension when I said the word woke in here. Um, but the church in Pergamum, there was a complaint that Jesus raised where you've become so broad-minded. And this is talking about the church, uh, the, the church having the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They'd become so broad-minded. They were accepting everything that they wound up really not believing much of anything. <clears throat> It results in not having much depth, no sense of conviction. And because you've tolerated those things by which their very nature should be destroyed, you wind up not having much depth in your belief. And when you start to tolerate just a little bit of something that's really not of God, it starts to grow really quickly. And it, it comes down to stuff like pronouns. It comes down to stuff like intersectionality. Uh, we, just re we need to be really careful in trying to fit in with the culture that we don't fit in with the Christ. You see what I'm saying? Very slippery slope. <clears throat> so there was dedication there was friction. Also, there was direction. Direction. You can see this in verse 16. Therefore, repent. That's a pretty clear direction, right? <laughs> Therefore, repent. Don't have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Don't have the doctrine of Balaam. 
Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. So notice the direction that he gave. What did he say they need to do? Repent, right? You can talk. Come on, you guys got to talk back to me better than this. I've been working with my girls. Don't talk back to daddy except during the sermon, right? (laughs) They're both in kids' church right now, but... Uh, He was not talking to the people who held the doctrine of Balaam or uh, the Nicolaitans. He was speaking to the church as a whole. And he was telling the church to repent. Now, how could the church repent? Because they were not guilty of believing those things. Um, But if you exclude those people from fellowship, Jesus said, we need to make sure that we're not giving false security to people um, because the people who held to um, the doctrine of Balaam, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, they needed to turn from those evil thoughts. And I want to say to you today, if you believe under the guise of love that if we really love people, then we'll just say all are welcome into the, this church family. I want you to know you can only join this church family if you indeed are a Christian. You're welcome to visit this church, but to be an actual member of this church, you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. That's why we have a new members class here to make sure that you understand if you're going to try to join this church, we sit under the same theology here, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, that Jesus is the Christ, that the only way to go to to heaven is through Jesus. And I know it sounds really kind And hear me, it sounds really kind to say, well, so-and-so believes that, uh, you know, Buddha or um, whatever religion you want to believe, that they'll probably go to their form of heaven. No, they will not. We do not believe in polytheism here, where there are multiple gods that lead to the same road of heaven. Jesus said to the church at Pergamum, you as a church had better repent and act on this matter or I will come and work against them. You judge them or I will judge them. They're in a place of death and God is saying, I must act if you don't act. So Christ will come himself and will remove from the church that which the church refuses to remove. So there was a dedicated word. Then there was a word of friction about some idolatrous activity that was taking place in and around the church. Then there was a direction given, repent. And then we close out this text with the word satisfaction. Satisfaction. You can see this in verse 17. Look at verse 17 with me. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The hidden manna, this is a really cool thing. It typifies the spiritual food that was provided by God in his word. And he's talking about individual feeding, not, church, not a church function. Which leads me to this. I need you guys to step up to a whole nother level when it comes to you feeding yourselves with the word of God. The hidden manna, it says. 
where God provided the manna in the Old Testament, but the people had to go and gather it for themselves, right? Right? God provides the manna. God provides his word. The bread of life, he provides his word. But we need to gather it together. Now, there are many ideas. Just just look at this, this little thing in verse 17 again, where it talks about the white stone. You see that right in the middle of verse 17? I will give him a white stone. A white stone. Now, there's no question what the whiteness represents when it comes to the stone. The whiteness represents the purity of it, the holiness of God. So it represents that which is ours in God. The new name doubtless represents the name that a believer receives in Jesus Christ. There were some beautiful uses of a white stone in ancient times. I think this is really cool. Sometimes a white stone, it would represent something that was given to a man after trial when he was found not guilty. So they would say, you're found not guilty Here's a white stone, being that you are found pure in this situation. Sometimes after, instead of it being after a trial, a white stone would be given over to somebody after battle. And it represented that somebody came to victory. So they were given a white stone after trial. They were given a white stone after battle, saying that they are the victors. Sometimes a person was given a white stone when they were granted citizenship. And they were given a white stone in ancient times. Signified their new status that they had in that country. Sometimes two friends would have a white stone. They would crack it in half. This was really the first, you know, the friendship necklaces that a lot of girls wear. You know what I'm talking about? They're kind of jagged hearts and you put them together and it says BFF or something like that. Anyway, my oldest has one. The first ever BFF necklace was the white stone where two friends would break the stone, a white stone in half. And who knows, maybe generations later, each would put the stone together and they would say, oh, our ancestors apparently we're friends, so we should be friends. And it was the, uh, the impetus for a good lasting relationship moving forward. But when we apply to our Christian faith, what a beautiful thing a white stone is. The white stone after a trial of acquittal, it speaks of our justification. When through Jesus Christ, we're judged righteous. The white stone of victory signifies the triumph of the child of God over all of our enemies. The white stone of citizenship indicates our free entrance into the city of God. The white stone of unending friendship indicates our relationship with our Lord Jesus. And when we obey him, we get a white stone with a new name and a hidden manna that God shall give. And what a beautiful promise that is to the church. But it must be very clearly understood that the church of Jesus Christ must not tolerate within her borders those who lower the standards of truth. And it's not a question of holding the truth. The church at Pergamum did that. It's a question of the right application of the truth because truth never excuses sin. Never. Error will not be suppressed by compromising with it. It's always sinful to countenance evil amongst believers. If there's no repentance as is given in that clear direction, the church must expel the error. It should not be done legalistically, but it should be done lovingly and firmly. And the enemies of truth and of God in our day are largely within the church, unfortunately. The peril is inside. It's the weakness, the compromise with evil that that is our direst danger today. So Jesus said in conclusion, 
Jesus said, take your firm stand and I will give you hidden manna in a white stone with a new name written upon it. I think that's a beautiful truth. Right now, what I want to encourage you to do is just to stand up very quietly, very reverently. Go ahead and stand up. And as you stand, (coughs) I made it the whole sermon without coughing. I'm really grateful to God for that. I prayed for that. But as you stand today, I I just want to encourage you. You've heard a message about a church that believed in the right things, but they had some flaws. If you're praying about joining a church today, I I hope that you're praying about joining Farmington first because we're a church that believes in proper doctrine, although we do have our flaws. I want to encourage you today to come forward and pray about something or someone. Pray for the health of this church. Satan would love to come in while this church is very healthy right now. He would love to come in and infiltrate as we possibly are in the shadows of his headquarters here in the U.S. in particular. Maybe you've got something going on in your life and you need somebody to pray over you. I'd love to pray over you, Pastor Jacob would. So you come forward in a moment and pray for that. Or maybe you just straight up need to become a Christian. And the way that you do that is you just say to the Lord, Lord, I I believe that you're the one true God. I confess to you that I'm a sinner. I repent of that. I give my life over to you. I believe that you died you were buried and you were resurrected as you lived a perfect life all all of your days. And now I want to follow you. If you want to give your life to Christ, I encourage you to do that. Maybe you need to get baptized and show people outwardly what the Lord's already done inwardly. You come forward and you make that decision. So bow your head with me and let's pray. Lord, we pray that anybody in here today who needs to make a decision for you, that they'll do that. Have them come forward, Lord. Have them make a decision where they'll just uh, say, yes, I need, to, I need to receive Christ. Yes, I need to confess sin. Yes, I need to pray for somebody or something. But have them come, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.